Great. Thanks very much. So as you mentioned, my name is Matt Camerite. I'm here from, from Daiquiri today. And uh, to give you a little bit of background before I, I jump in on kind of AR everywhere, which is going to be the meat of what we'll talk about today, uh, I want to give you a little bit of evidence as to why you should listen to me and, and why we have credibility in this space. So daiquiri has been in the AR space for about six years now. We've gone through a lot of different iterations of consumer and marketing tech, uh, hardware and software, and have really seen you know, a lot of different angles on this ecosystem and, and how it's been developing. Uh, and I personally came over from the customer side. So I was one of Daiquiri's first enterprise customers prior to joining the team. And so I've seen things kind of from both sides of the table in terms of uh, the buyer perspective, as well as uh, the provider or the implementer uh, on the other side of the table. Um, so what I'll try to do today is use all of that um, to look at this concept of augmented reality everywhere, which is something that's being touched on, obviously, in a ton of different sessions here uh, in all different ways. And what I want to focus on is what are the things that you can do from a practical perspective to participate in that becoming a reality? Because it's something that's been talked about for a very, very long time. And Daiquiri has a perspective on kind of what are some of the major components here. But it's really critical that this is a participatory ecosystem and one where all of us are collaborating actively um, to bring about this reality that we want to see. And that's really what, what the you know, theme of AWE is all, all about. Now, to start off here, just so I have a sense of, of kind of who's here, um, since we tend to have very eclectic audiences at AWE, a uh, quick poll for everybody. So if you would self-identify as a developer, coder, programmer, uh, hands up. Okay, as expected for the developer track. Uh, if you uh, qualify as a product person, product manager, uh, product idea person, business model person, hands up. Uh, designer, anything creative? Very underrepresented here in the developer track, not surprising. Uh, and uh, anything else? Miscellaneous. I didn't mention who you are or, or what you're doing here. Investor? No? Good. So it looks like about 80% developer. So I'll focus mostly on that side of the tools and the use cases today. Um, and I can go deeper on, on a number of these topics depending on, on what you guys want to look at. Um, but Let's start with sort of a state of the ecosystem as it stands today. Um, there's certainly a lot of augmented reality all over the place. I'm not sure that we've achieved this uh, dream of the consumer vision of augmented reality everywhere, where it's this seamless experience that follows you wherever you go, where the hardware and the software is a natural part of your day-to-day -day life and your social interactions and uh, all of the tools that you make use of for your work. And so what we have today is this fragmented ecosystem. And ultimately, at Daiquiri, we see three key areas where we can make tremendous progress in the near term um, towards achieving that more cohesive vision. And I'll elucidate kind of what those are, what the enabling technologies are around them, and then uh, ways to collaborate or participate in, in that ecosystem. And of those three, the one that I'll, I'll start with, probably not surprising for uh, the makers of the Daiquiri Smart Helmet, um, is at work. You know, it's one where we feel like uh, there's still a tremendous amount of work uh, no pun intended, left to do, and a lot of uh, industries that are going to be transformed or impacted in ways that they're just beginning to see, just beginning to plan for. And so this context of the industrial internet of things really sets the stage for that. And this is something that uh, you know, is obviously top of mind for every uh, end user, every customer that you work with. It's really the bedrock or the foundation you know, upon which you build. And, and the starting point is understanding all of these things. So if you don't have a baseline understanding of things like the physical networks required, the security infrastructure layered on top of those, uh, the systems integration needs necessary to deploy within an industrial or an enterprise ecosystem, I would say go learn those things first and come learn AR later. Um, because those are, are definitely cost of entry. Though, as I'll mention later, there may be some opportunities to partner with people who today are in the enterprise uh, to collaborate and kind of uh, cross-pollinate in that fashion. So for us, uh, you know, it's obviously about wearables. It's all obviously about uh, content and getting that content to the end user. And so we have two major components that we use uh, in order to achieve that vision. 
and these are representative of categories of technology you'll see elsewhere. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on uh, Daiquiri-specific stuff today because I want to give you a sense of what, what the ecosystem looks like. Uh, when we get to q and I'm happy to, to provide more information on, on the Daiquiri stuff. Otherwise, obviously, we've got a lot of uh, public material out there. Um, but both the hardware, the software, uh, the end user, and the authoring ecosystem are really the critical technology components here. And uh, this is where I'll take a look at uh, Daiquiri-specific architecture, but one that I think is representative, and I'll show how it's representative of, of a broader ecosystem. So it obviously starts, uh, all starts with the hardware. And for us, that hardware is not just one discrete implementation. It's really a continuum of things that address a variety of different use cases and form factors, different sets of constraints. Uh, we truly do not believe there's a silver bullet across industrial and consumer and automotive and all of these different form factors. And while there may be, you know, in some distant future, I think optimizing the user experience in a variety of configurations is really the, the near-term reality um, that we see. And then on top of that, you have a tightly coupled, and in our case, custom operating system. Um, this is you know, kind of one of those caveats in terms of looking at alternative hardware, looking at uh, any options that are out there as a, a foundational bedrock to begin your development. If you're not looking at something where they've addressed latency issues in the hardware layer, where they've addressed uh, direct access and, and sensor fusion, where they've addressed uh, the ability for all of those things to be passed through directly to the developer, for custom application development. All of those, you know, for us at least, would kind of be non-starters. And for a lot of these industrial use cases would be non-starters. Um, and so that tightly coupled uh, OS, and in our case a custom OS, is, is one of the requirements there. I won't spend a ton of time on things like you know, CV or depth mapping. There are obviously a lot of other sessions here that are talking about those. I want to give you more of a, a holistic view of the ecosystem. Uh, one important factor there is that we view these other implementations, and I'll, I'll uh, expand more on things like automotive and, and uh, in-home uh, as we go along today, but they really need to all be part of one conversation. And the critical reason for that is so that you have a consistent API, consistent framework across uh, all of those different implementations. And while they may have very different expressions of that, what that's going to allow you to do is take things like identity and preferences and security and pass those across all of those different hardware paradigms uh, and maintain a, a more cohesive development ecosystem so that as you are having the same set of developers or the same set of users uh, pass across different device types, which is becoming more and more the reality, um, that you're going to have that integration that they're going to expect so that you don't create sort of a, you know, early days of Bluetooth or even current days of Bluetooth sort of scenario where uh, people just, just meet it with frustration at the very mention of, uh, of that protocol. Um, then on top of that, you have the application layer. And in our view, uh, we had to create fully featured applications as well as the ability to create custom applications. So ones that uh, go very deep into the hardware, take advantage of the optimization that's there, you know, put things into an FPGA, move them towards hardware acceleration uh, in order to enable that, that robust set of capabilities so that when you take the device out of the box, it's useful from day one. And we think that's really critical because, you know, had in 2007, they said, uh, here's an SDK in the iPhone phone, we, I don't think any of us would be sitting here with them today uh, without those uh, core set of apps. But then on top of that, you've obviously got to be able to uh, both create the application infrastructure from a custom development standpoint, and I'll go deeper on each of these in a moment, um, but also recognize early and often the role that corporate IT or enterprise IT device management is going to play in any of these implementations. Because otherwise, you're always going to be stuck at sort of that pilot scale, that proof of concept scale, where you just have you know, a small handful of devices because you haven't really ratified them as a part of the broader ecosystem and gotten them onto the public networks and, and then taken advantage of all of what that connectivity can provide. Oops. I'll do that build again. And then ultimately, it's not just the developer skill set that matters from an authoring perspective. It's also the design skill set, the content management skill set, work package authoring. And so from our perspective, that's 40 Studio, web-based authoring tool. Um, but it can be you know, a number of different platforms where you've got transferable skills. You know, really, the caveat here is if you're 
doing your program planning and it looks like you're having to create a whole new skill set or send a whole bunch of people to training, you're probably missing a piece uh, in terms of the implementation where you could be leveraging uh, some of this middleware that's already existing in the ecosystem. And so when you look at this architecture overall, um, and I'll kind of speed through that, there are basically four main areas where I think there's opportunity both for collaboration, for developers to make an impact, whether those are independent developers, folks who are part of an enterprise, and I'll, I'll elucidate uh, kind of the differences between those categories as we go along. Um, but it's critical that you've addressed essentially all four of these if you want to impact work especially. Um, but we think it's, it's critical for the consumer as well, though these things maybe are a little bit more ambiguated or, or invisible by the time they get to the consumer. So the net result of this, and it's important to you know, keep the eye on the prize as far as realizing the potential of transforming work, is that you could have any worker served up any task that matches their abilities, matches their education at any time. And there's obviously a lot of opportunities for machine learning, for uh, algorithmic association of tasks to individuals based on competency or attention, um, lots of different dynamics here to take advantage of. But what I want to focus on today, you know, especially for you guys as, as primarily developers, is how can you capitalize on this? So for each of the three main areas, I'm going to talk about um, how you can capitalize on it. And so as far as work goes, first, the app ecosystem. You know, there's, there's almost an infinite number of opportunities here to pick an industry, pick a job type, uh, all different economies of scale that folks who are trying to play across many industries, like ourselves, are not going to be able to get to today, but that are critical for that enterprise, that industry, to take advantage of the technology and really get off the ground. Another way to do that is to be a translator and to bring that uh, mindset either from the enterprise to AR or vice versa. Um, and to think about things like this distributed enterprise model, where everything is on demand and, and maybe the worker and the enterprise aren't as tightly coupled as employer, employee, um, but think more along the lines of the Uber model or uh, on demand uh, association of labor to projects or enterprises. What tools would be necessary in that ecosystem? What sorts of capabilities from a hardware or software standpoint would be necessary in order to take advantage of that? Now, shameless plug. Um, Working for Daiquiri is a great way to work on some of those problems if you are independent and don't want to be. Um, but there's plenty of stuff that you can do independently as well. So that covers work. The next major area that I'll talk about is in the car. This is one that we're tremendously excited about. It's something that um, you know, we think is actually nearer term than a lot of even the, the work applications um, from a consumer implementation standpoint. And that's bringing augmented reality to the vehicle both in today's configuration, where the driver is really in the lead, um, but then especially as we move into assisted and then autonomous configurations uh, in the short years ahead. And uh, Dacry is already providing you know, hundreds of thousands of HUDs out there on the road today, working with you know, many other automakers on, on programs to implement uh, similar capabilities as well as next generation capabilities uh, on top of that and really bring you know, this immersive display bring uh, true holography actually to, uh, to the vehicle. And so when you look at uh, the stack here, or all of the layers, and this again, think of it as you know, essentially there's opportunity from a developer standpoint at every single one of these layers. So starting at the lowest level with individual sensor design, you know, uh, specific chip architectures or hardware design to take advantage of the sensor capabilities, think Movidius or, or that type of implementation. Um, OS level uh, stuff on the automotive side is still very nascent, still very young. Intel and a number of others are, are making great strides in this space, but there's still a lot of really interesting problems to solve and a lot of low hanging fruit even for independent developers who want to be a part of uh, transforming transportation or, or the driving experience. Um, primary application layer, continued advancements here. I think here you're seeing more consolidation, more of the big players starting to, uh, to own the space from a data perspective, um, but still you know, a lot of uh, niche implementations or extensions of those capabilities into an immersive display, into an AR configuration that have yet to be uh, thought through or, or fleshed out. And then that 
you know, carries on all the way through uh, to the end user applications. And uh, I won't pretend that automotive is not a complex ecosystem in terms of uh, how you deploy hardware and software, how long it takes to get to the consumer, but ultimately it's only by working together with that industry that we're gonna be able to solve some of these challenges because they bring you know, access to the serial bus of the vehicle, they bring uh, access to the navigation data being fed out of that main, that main bus so that in, if you're not working with them, you're not going to be able to tap into it or you're not going to be able to tap into it with the sort of uh, low latency that you need uh, to deliver that to the end user in the vehicle. So tons of opportunities here, but it's, again, a very partner-driven ecosystem. So the opportunities for developers look like uh, cross-platform applications. What are the things that, um, again, economies of scale across different vehicle programs, across different uh, geographies, across different use cases, and uh, thinking certainly assisted and probably autonomous very, very quickly. I think one of the most exciting things to me in talking with the automakers is to hear how critical they see AR as being as part of the next generation, the next generation of where they're headed. Um, they say, you know, it's hugely important today, and by the time you get to autonomous, it's everything, essentially. It becomes really the, the mainstay or the foundational element of the driver experience, um, and that's something that we're hearing over and over um, from, you know, the largest players in the world as far as automotive is concerned. And finally, in the home. And we think, you know, from a Daiquiri perspective, that the home and the consumer is probably the furthest out, probably the most fragmented in terms of the implementation here. I think we're, we're seeing some really promising stuff in terms of entertainment and gaming. Um, but as far as uh, lifestyle applications, utility-based uh, applications, integration with the smart home, uh, it's still very much in the laboratory phase. You know, the photo on the, the bottom left-hand side, there's one out of the MIT Media Lab, and we're seeing dozens of these really interesting projects uh, cropping up that are taking advantage of things like AR Toolkit and other open source capabilities, pairing those up with IoT smart home platforms and starting to uh, crack away at this. But the threshold for the consumer to adopt is still really, really high. Uh, it's not something that's easy to deploy. It's not something you know, where, where everything's been figured out. And what that means is you know, opportunities abound. Again, you know, for all different classes of developers as part of organizations or as independents, to grab onto some of these problems and to uh, solve them either in partnership with an existing player or as independent entities. And that starts you know, all the way at the lowest level, just like with the automotive, and then moves all the way up to the content ecosystem. I'd say, if, if anything, we're seeing too much at the top end of the spectrum that faces directly to the consumer um, and sort of skipping steps in terms of figuring out the hardware experience, figuring out how to make that more accessible to the consumer. Uh, on the VR side as well, I think you're seeing a lot of those same sort of hurdles get skipped. You know, when it takes you an hour and a half to set up a Vive, uh, it's just not gonna pass the threshold for a lot of, uh, a lot of consumers or, or casual gamers. So how can you capitalize here? Um, you know, Certainly compelling consumer content, but I would, I would encourage everyone not to get distracted by that or drawn into that artificially as the only place um, to do things. I think IO is a tremendous area of opportunity uh, where um, there's some interesting work being done, but still a very inconsistent implementation across all different device types. It's another area where I don't think there's any silver bullet, and I think uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for even independent developers who just try out a bunch of different devices paired with a bunch of different wearables and see what works and what doesn't, and start to map out uh, a UI and an interaction framework. Um, there's just so much that somebody with that augmented reality perspective can bring to it. Um, so the next component of how we make this a reality, I think, has to do with what type of developer or what type of player in the ecosystem you look at yourself as. So I'm going to look at four roles really quickly um, and touch on what I think the areas of opportunity are in the immediate term for those four different kinds of developers. Um, so first, for the solo developer or, or the independent, and I think a lot of people uh, here probably fall into that category. Um, you know, showcasing new capabilities is great as long as you can you know, bootstrap and, and run off of existing resources to do so. I would say partnering up either with an existing provider or with an enterprise or even with a number of those folks um, is really becoming critical to success here uh, because it's not a software only play, because everything's not being deployed on consumer hardware like iPads, uh, like it was 
was just a few years ago, I think it's more critical than ever that the independent developer uh, have that network of relationships, be in those preferred developer programs for the different pieces of hardware, um, be testing out those SDKs prior to um, the enterprise even being able to get a hold of them in many cases, and building that knowledge base. And what that does for the provider, you know, speaking from, from firsthand experience, is that allows us to multiply our impact too, because it means that uh, more people are out there knowing exactly what the sweet spot is for our hardware, our software, and can pair that with the use cases that they're finding across industries that we can't get to uh, or ones that, uh, that we're never going to try to get to because um, they have an enabling segment within that industry that's, that's really needed. Open source is a great way both to build that network, to prove out skills, to um, build a knowledge base and, and things that you can demonstrate for the customer. And then we, we depend very much on the evangelism of the independent developer. Uh, next one for, for the founder, you know, and I think a lot of people here uh, as well identify in this category, and uh, the first two are certainly not mutually exclusive. Um, so we touched on a bunch of these areas of, of specific opportunity, um, but I think there's, there's, you know, the opportunity to build a lot of small, probably some medium and even some large scale businesses around these opportunities, and they're ones where the pain points are real, they exist today, you know, I, I can state firsthand that there are things that we would purchase, you know, that the enterprises that we're working with would purchase, but that neither one of us is going to create. And that really is that sweet spot uh, for, for the independent developer. Next, the developer within the enterprise. Um, this is really where I started out in my career and, and something that I'll always have, have a fondness for um, is you know, that, that independent who's within a large organization, which is this great double-edged sword, which is often hard to understand from the outside, where you've got a tremendous amount of resources. You've got the, the muscle, potentially, of a large company, a large buying organization, you know, processes to, to help things scale. Uh, easier in some cases, but then you've also got the bureaucracy that comes with that. If you're a public company, you've got you know, independent scrutiny or regulatory uh, attention uh, that comes along with that. And so here, you know, very familiar list of words that need to be tackled, but it's all uh, you know, ones that are critical to scaling within the enterprise. And finally, for the independent, or the brand new developer rather, um, this could be a student or just somebody who's you know, making a switch or wants to take on this ecosystem and has never uh, played here before. These are just a handful of recommendations. They're representative of the categories. They're not by any means the only ones in the categories. They are the ones that we tend to use in each of these categories. Um, so things like you know, C and C++ as the primary uh, interface languages for, in our case, our, our overall API. Um, Linux and Android being sort of a sweet spot for uh, nascent development or new development in this area. You know, we'll be putting out both a Unity plugin and, and uh, Eclipse support as well for integration with the Daiquiri tools. And then open source is certainly a, a tremendous area both to learn, to cut your teeth, build that network, find mentors. And you know, we've got a, a ton of folks who are active and always looking for new folks to work with within that ecosystem. So ultimately, it's only by uh, all of us working together that we're going to achieve that sort of seamless vision that, that we all want to get to, and that we're going to be able to achieve that outcome uh, that everyone's been looking forward to for the last couple of decades. And, and it feels closer than ever, but at times, you know, the problems feel, feel just as big as they ever were. Um, so that's where we, we feel it's really critical that we're all working together uh, in order to solve those. And so in order to, to deliver on that, uh, I'd be happy to take some questions today. But also, we've got you know, tons of folks, more folks here than ever uh, from Daiquiri, uh, both in our main booth and in the AR Toolkit booth where we're showing off uh, Altera for the first time, a project that I'm, I'm really excited about uh, personally. Um, so thank you, and, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Yeah, we have a time for a couple questions. OK. Yeah, ah. Friedland. Friedland. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I assume you're pushing towards uh, both standards and you know, how, 
how industry can work together with uh, non-industry partners or independent entities uh, as far as standardization. And, and it's still a huge area of opportunity. I think we've, we've made some progress, but not nearly as much as we could have in terms of content in interoperability. I think we're starting to see consistency in 3D standards. You're starting to see certain development ecosystems or development tools uh, you know, really gain uh, a lot more momentum than others. So Unity is a great example where I think you know, there was, a, there was a, a clear war between a number of different engines, and we're seeing Unity kind of emerge as the likely victor as far as AR implementations go. So now that we have that, starting to have consistent architecture for plugins, starting to have, you know, public entities like the area that we're all participating in, which is the Augmented Reality for Enterprise Alliance, who's uh, running one of the tracks here. Um, those opportunities to get together to talk through what those, what those things look like, but also, uh, you know, always important to promote preserve you know commercial viability to preserve you know the ability for all the companies in the ecosystem to to operate in the market and to to hash out a living as well yeah that's a that's a great great question because as a person who deals with enterprise that's always the issue of how do you get data from one place into another without having to convert it to something that a game engine is yeah, and, and they often already have seven different places it's being stored with different levels of authoritativeness at each stage for different factors. So one more place to store stuff or one more format is uh, not exciting. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so any other questions? No? Cool. Okay, well, Thank you, big round of applause, uh, please. Yeah.